Um, now let's start the session. Uh, so the, the title of the discussion today is Can We Reduce Unintended Pregnancy in Canada? Pregnancy um, Expanding Opportunities with Long-Acting Reversible Contraception. Mm -hmm. Our speaker is Dr. Dustin Kostescu, <laughs> I said that correctly, and um, he is a fam family planning specialist and assistant professor at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, he received his doctorate of medicine from Western University and completed residency at McMaster, followed by a fellowship in contraception, contraception advice, research, and education at Queen's University. He is also the director of continuing ed education for the department of OBGYN at McMaster and is a regional Poposcopy and Cervical Screening Lead with Cancer Care Ontario. In addition to conducting research in contraception, decision making, and gender aspects of reproductive options counseling, his clinical practice focuses in high risk and challenging contraception cases, sexual medicine, family planning, as well as general OBGYN. He has been an invited lecturer at several medical education conferences and is thrilled to be presenting today. Um, so, Please uh, remember that we will be doing an evaluation at the end, and it's through your touchpad, so please stay and do the evaluation before, you, before the next session. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me come and speak to you today. Um, these are some of the industry relationships with which I hold. I will not be um, too controversial in using off-label or investigational uh, products in the talk today. Today is going to be more of a big picture discussion. I want you to be able to walk away from today's talk being able to carry on a rational, factual conversation about unintended pregnancy in Canada. This is a topic that many people bring a lot of personal emotions to, first-hand, second-hand, through our loved ones or through our patients. I recognize that I spend a lot of my career dealing with the consequences of unprotected intercourse through colposcopy, family planning, and contraception. And so we need to think about this more in terms of what does the day-to-day -day work that we do impact on the big picture. Um, I want you to be able to identify some of the risk factors and why it's becoming increasingly important to address the issue of unintended pregnancy in younger women, dispel some myths about IUC use which we know are common amongst healthcare providers, and briefly discuss some of the evidence um, to mitigate that. So whenever somebody goes, you might be start a talk, the first thing you do is you go on Google and you figure out what clip art you're going to put in your talk. So that's the first thing I did. And, and this is usually what comes up when you talk about unattended pregnancy. You see sad people looking at pregnancy tests. And then you look at the magazine covers, things like McLean's article that came out in 2005 and another t uh, one from Time from 2001, and usually with really great titles like Babies Having Babies or Children Having Children. I think it's always important to remember that some really great things happen as a result of unintended and pregnancies, and for those of you who are wondering, um, I'm not one to use these, uh, yeah, that, that's actually me. I'm a proud unintended conception. Um, so, you know, good things can come from those who weren't expected to be here. Um, please grab your um, pads. We're going to do a little bit of kind of knowledge sharing. So, I'd like to know what you all believe the approximate rate of unintended pregnancy is in Canada. So, that's the proportions of pregnancies in Canada that are unintended. Excellent. So approximately 40 to 50 percent, that, uh, that is the correct answer. There are, is one study that says 39 percent, um, so you wouldn't be totally wrong to be in C, and A and B is certainly where we're heading. The second question is, what proportion of unintended pregnancies arise as a result of contraceptive failure? So couples using one or more forms of birth control. Okay, excellent. So the correct answer is actually 50%. In countries where contraceptive uptake is higher, that proportion actually increases as well. So if you look at pregnancies by intention and contraceptive use across various countries, 19.5% of pregnancies that occur in Canada, that's all pregnancies, occur directly as a result of contraceptive failure. Similar number occur in those who don't use contraception. That's a small percentage of the population who give us a large number. And then 61% of our pregnancies are intended. Um, contrasting that to France, where contraceptive uptake is higher, 
but the proportion of pregnancies that result from failure is also larger. So you see only a very small contributor amongst contraceptive non-users, or what we call unmet family uh, planning needs, which are people who don't want to get pregnant but aren't taking steps to prevent it. Um, like many things in life, we do better than in the US, and we're not quite as caught up as Europe. So in the States, 25.5% or over a quarter of pregnancies result uh, from failure. Um, of course, we know that many of the unintended pregnancies end in abortion, and in, in Canada and the United States, that's approximately 40%, uh, which gives us an abortion rate of about 28.3 abortions per 100 live births. To put that in a different perspective, uh, we always like to use comparators to other specialties. A woman in Canada is actually more likely to have an abortion in their lifetime than to have their appendix taken out. Um, and if we had things in life that we could prevent appendectomies with a significant amount of fervor, I suspect the landscape of appendectomy would look very different. And we take this as a fact. And take with this whatever values you want to, numbers are numbers. And this is how we have a rational conversation about unintended pregnancy. I think it's important to remember, of course, like me, many unintended pregnancies grow up to become people. And um, if you do a little bit of a calculation on that, we actually have about 65,000 extra Canadians here every year that we're not planned for. Um, that's if you correct for a miscarriage rate. If we assume that the majority of unintended pregnancies are in fact the abortions, and we know a very small number of those, for instance, genetic terminations would be planned pregnancies that still go on to end. Um, we get that number. So what is the cost of that? Well, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is what does it actually cost to raise a child to the age of 18? Um, if you look at a Canadian magazine that tried to calculate this out, they extrapolated data from the US Department of Agriculture that provides this figure in the States, and they came up with about $243,000 to raise a child up to basically their high school graduation, not including their tuition. Um, Stats Canada would argue we spend about seventy dollars to $80,000 over that period in extra consumption, so extra food, extra clothes. Um, and the Fraser Institute, of course, is going to give us a smaller number um, because they're penny pinchers, so we only spend $63,000 um, on those kids. Obviously, that varies by income quartile or quintile, so um, many physicians in the room will be spending more money on their kids than those who live in the, uh, the poor uh, quartiles. If you put that information together, Canadians spend on average four to $15 billion per year on unintended children. Now, those of us who will be voting blue in the election if you're living in Ontario this month would say, yes, they go on to contribute to the GDP. But in fact, remember, these were unanticipated expenses. So Canadian families are spending at best $4 billion, at worst $15.8 billion a year, uh, which they could be putting towards other um, life events or things that they've planned for. So babies do not come cheap. That's nearly 1% of our GDP is raising unintended kids. So I want to, um, with that information, look a little bit about what unintended pregnancy looks like across the demographics uh, in Canada. So another question, which I think is really important to address. Over the past 20 years, has the age of first intercourse decreased significantly, decreased slightly, stayed stable, increased slightly, or increased significantly? Okay, so um, the age of first intercourse is, has uh, actually stayed roughly the same um, over the last 20 years. So people are worried about uh, young children having uh, sex um, and you certainly a very alarmist view in the media about that. And these are birth cohorts. So if you're comparing those who were born in 1991 um, to those born in 1971, in fact, um, the numbers are actually increasing very slightly um, and the overall trend is one towards a decrease from uh, our grandparents or parents, depending on where we sit. Some of this is related to changing in demographic trends related to immigration and to cultures where intercourse tends to be delayed. Um, but yeah, even in uh, Canada and North America, intercourse at the ages of 12 and younger still tends to be very rare and tends to be non-consensual. That number is not changing significantly. Looking at rates of adolescent pregnancy, Similar question, have they decreased significantly, decreased slightly, stayed stable, increased slightly, or increased significantly? Excellent. I would actually go as far as to say that our rates of adolescent pregnancy are decreasing significantly. Um, but that's, uh, that's good. Perfect, yeah, there's the happy face. 
So if you look at adolescent pregnancy rates over the last period of time, they have increased significantly um, over time. And with a, a decrease in rate of pregnancy, similarly, um, rates of abortion and fetal loss have changed. Why is that? Well, those who are continuing to have pregnancies in adolescence, remember, some of them still tend to be the early entrance into marriage or planned pregnancies at the 18, 19 years of age. So the unintended pregnancy rate is likely decreasing as well. Interestingly, in the United States, and this comes from the Guttmacher Institute, which provides um, research in family planning topics, U.S. teen pregnancy rate has actually never been lower than it is currently. What happened in about 2005 is we saw a small blip in the, the literature, and we all started worrying. That's when this McLean article came out, and people thought that the movie Juno was promoting unprotected intercourse amongst adolescents. It turns out that it wasn't good enough of a movie because it didn't work uh, long term. In Canada, we're seeing a slightly more muted response, but it's also important to remember the magnitude of pregnancies is quite different. So with a lower number, net number of births to teenage mothers, one would expect not to see such a dramatic decrease because it takes a bit more effort on a public health basis to make change. In terms of other reproductive trends that are important to remember, we're getting married less, uh, less and less. So we are at the lowest rate of marriage um, as of 2008, which is the last year for which we have reliable data, and the next years will be coming out shortly, which is 4.4 marriages per year per 1,000 people, and marriage is being delayed. So we are, women are getting married about seven years later uh, than they were back in the 70s, and similar trend for men with a similar age distribution. And childbirth as well as being delayed, I know that was mentioned earlier today, and it will be a topic that will permeate throughout um, the sessions, no doubt. But the mean age of mothers, according to Stats Canada, currently is 29.1, um, and 51.2% of births occurred in mothers over 30. Statisticians in the room remember there's not as much time on the upper limits, so you skew your numbers um, downwards when you're calculating arithmetic means. Um, but that number has significantly increased, and many of us in the room who are conceptuses of 30-year-olds might remember that we were high-risk pregnancies once. To put this into a different perspective, let's think about what's going to happen to a woman across her reproductive life cycle. So at some point, she's going to become uh, sexually active, or coitarchy, or some people like to call coital debut, which sounds really quite dramatic. Um, and uh, then they, they're going to wait a few years, usually uh, 3.7 years, and then they're going to go on to have their first pregnancy. And uh, you know, at some point we had three, the, the third one's optional, of course. And they might take steps in between to try to prevent that. Then we would sterilize them and they would go on to, uh, to menopause. Now we're asking a lot more of our women. If you compare data from the 60s, to now, you will see a slightly uh, lower number for coitarchy. That's why they're a little bit skewed. But women are now waiting about almost 10 years from their first intercourse to their first planned child. What that means is they have a longer time in which they're expected to delay their childbearing, a longer period of time under which that pregnancy is going to be unintended, and it's taking longer and longer for women and men to complete the schooling they need to enter the workforce for similar jobs than it would have been a generation ago. It's also important to remember that younger women, just by virtue of being younger women, are at increased risk of unintended pregnancy uh, based on some other risk factors. Specifically, if we all reflect on our own adolescence, coital frequency was higher in adolescence than it was now. Um, and also, we know a per cycle fertility rate is lower. Um, women are less likely to have irregular cycles, or they may be more likely to compensate for irregular cycles when they're younger. They're more likely to be a contraceptive non-user at first intercourse, although that is improving over the last few years. Um, but many of the contraceptive users in adolescence are using things like condoms or withdrawal, so they're not using the most effective options. And similarly for young women, they may not know how to appropriately navigate or negotiate contraceptive use. So if they're using male-led products like condoms and withdrawal, they're not advocating their own use of more effective methods. And of course, particularly when we look at American studies, we don't have as good data in, the, in Canada, if you look at adolescent risk factors, there's often a whole host of other socioeconomic risk factors at play. So if you intersect with other disenfranchised groups, you're a younger woman of color, for instance, or you're an LGBT woman, then you may actually have other risk factors for unintended pregnancy based on your social location. So how do we make further gains in reducing unintended pregnancy? The first thing I want you to walk away at this point is, we're actually not doing that bad, but there is certainly room for improvement. 
So largely in the family planning world, there are two strategies on how we do this. The first, and this has been the predominant theme for a very long time and is still used in many countries, is to increase contraceptive uptake in non-users. So get people who don't want to be pregnant and aren't sure how to not be pregnant onto something that's going to prevent pregnancy. Typically that means starting them on the pill, or at the very least getting them to use condoms. A different paradigm is to get women to consider changing their contraceptive methods from those that are less effective to those that are the more effective methods. So for those of you in the room who still want to focus on the non-users, I wanted to provide this chart. This is data in the United States looking at women across various uh, reproductive age groups and where they're at in their life in terms of um, pregnancy planning or not planning. So at the very, very top, um, we have those who are sterilized and it surprised me that 1% of 18 and 19 year olds in this, in this cohort were sterilized, but that's the report. 44% um, in the younger women were contracepting with some sort of contraceptive method that's reversible and that increases up until the 40s. Those who are pregnant and trying to conceive are indicated in the green. The lower blue numbers are those who are not sexually active, which is why that number only decreases. And then the red box would be where we would focus our energy. And if you look at that, what that means is we would be spending a lot of time and energy on that less than 10% of women who continue to be contraceptive non-users. Here's the challenge. If we look at the reasons that these users are non-users, the most important risk factor is that they're ambivalent about unintended pregnancy. So they're already not sure that the pregnancy would really be an oops or something that they'd want to do, or their plan would be to parent if they got pregnant. So it's hard to even call some of those women um, true non-contraceptors who don't want to get pregnant. They also tend to be women who have other risk factors that make them less likely to conceive spontaneously. So women who are 35 and older, women who have certain fears or uncertainties about contraception partly related to medical issues, those who tend to have infrequent intercourse or who aren't in a relationship who don't want to stay on a product that they're not going to get a, any use out of, those who are not in a relationship and not planning to be, and then the other ones that we can very slightly make differences in, which are method dissatisfaction, which involves structured contraception counseling, but also provider dissatisfaction. So if they don't like you, to spite you, they're gonna stop their pill, and nothing gets me back more than getting pregnant, apparently. Um, as well as, of course, the socioeconomic and demographic risk factors. Now, um, those of you who do live in Ontario, there's an election coming up, technically you might be able to make a difference there, but we know, by and large, it's very, very hard to make widespread socio-demographic change, apart from contraception, which we've already done. So what are the contraceptors using? Um, this is the uh, Canadian Contraception Study, which looks at uh, what Canadian women are using. And this roughly, of course, you are allowed to pick more than one use, which is great. Um, so uh, most of those condom uses are using some other method or dual method of protection, um, which is pretty good. What always strikes me from this uh, chart is that more women in Canada are using um, the spermicidal film that you can get at shoppers than they are the long-acting reversibles, um, which I, as a man uh, who doesn't use these products, kind of always forget that it even exists. So, um, you know, women are smarter than me to remember that. If we've already optimized our method selection, then this graph should approximate what the failure rates are for um, contraceptives, which means that women should already preferentially be using those most effective methods. And if those graphs don't match, then that would be my argument that we have room for improvement. So here's the failure rate. So clearly these graphs don't look the same. I don't think anyone has to have a stats background to know that. If you exclude the permanent sterilized patients, then that is even magnified more amongst the users of some type of a reversible contraceptive. So the, most, the methods that are most used in Canada are the ones that have the highest rates of failure. So I'm positing to you that in order to move forward in terms of reducing our unattended pregnancy rate, we need to increase the uptake of the most effective methods. We need to shift our paradigm. Non-users and getting them to be users is important, but we also need to encourage uptake of those that are most effective at pregnancy prevention, those that are most acceptable to women, the ones that they want to be using if they knew about them, and those, of course, that are cost-effective or cost-saving to the system. What are those products? Well, they're the long-acting reversibles or LARCs. 
So those are contraceptive methods. I'm a purist. I know some of the family planning people don't agree exactly with this definition. But I use anything that requires administration less than once per cycle. That would include the injectable contraception, although for the purpose of the talk, I'm going to deal with IUCs or intrauterine contraceptives because we all, by and large, agree that those are long-acting reversibles. Um, and what that means is you have a copper option or a progestin-containing hormone. I'm sure I don't need to belabor this point to you all. Larks all share a common theme. They're highly efficacious. Efficacy means your perfect use failure rates. They're highly effective, which means that your actual patients will experience a low failure rate. They're easy to administer, they're forgettable, and they're acceptable and have high rates of satisfaction amongst them. That wasn't the plan. They just all happen to have that benefit to them. Um, this slide I did not make. I should mention all of these slides are my own. I don't uh, usually put other people's slides in, but whenever I use a chart from a, a journal, I try to use their own copyright. So this is a, a study called the Contraceptive Choice Project in uh, St. Louis. I'm going to talk a bit about but this is a, a, a surrogate marker of efficacy. It's real world use, but they excluded the non-users and what it shows is, is contraceptive failure rates. And again, with statistical significance, uh, those who use long actings, which are in this cohort, copper IUD, levonorgestrel IUS, and progestin implant, which is not available here, um, had a significantly lower rate of unintended pregnancies or conception failures than you know, those using PPR, which is pill patch ring, or some people who are trying to be all buzzwordy will call them SARCs because they're short-acting um, reversible contraceptives. Um, DMPA falls somewhere in the middle. The biggest problem is that despite having relatively large numbers, the confidence intervals are quite big, so one really can't make conclusions comparing the non-depo to the depo uh, LARC users. Um, Similarly, the rate of satisfaction in this cohort was high. This cohort included reproductive women from the age of 15 and up until the 40s. And amongst adolescents and older women, um, they most liked their LNG IUS. This study came out largely when we only had the 52 milligram LNG IUS. So LCS12 uh, wasn't on the market yet. Um, Satisfaction rates are still high amongst uh, the copper users and then are roughly similar. They didn't provide confidence intervals uh, amongst the uh, shorter acting methods. Um, LARCs are also cost effective. So you will always save money if you use birth control in a patient. So in general, the healthcare system saves $4 on every dollar that is spent for contraception. Uh, in direct medical costs related to ongoing care and unintended pregnancy and pregnancy management. It does not include, um, for instance, uh, the treatment of unexpected VTEs that arise from pregnancies and postpartum. Um, that's just not, they weren't robust enough to calculate that. But some methods appear to be more cost effective than others because they're just better at preventing pregnancy. And if your surrogate marker is medical costs from pregnancy, it makes sense. So a cost effectiveness study was done in the United Kingdom, which showed that in fact on LNG, and GIUS, they saved 12 pounds for every pound that they spent on it. Um, you can't exactly extrapolate that to Canadian data um, because the unit costs were different and of course there's a, a currency conversion factor. But they saved approximately 86 million pounds a year just by increasing uptake of um, uh, IUSs. Um, from your patient's perspective, because they don't tend to care about the population um, cost, a copper IUD, particularly those that are um, the low cost um, non-branded products, of which there are now um, 11 that I'm aware of, um, cost approximately five cents per day over the life of the product. And a counseling point I always remind patients if they're paying out of pocket, they will walk away with the IUD for less than they would have paid for three months of pills. Um, so that is by far the least expensive method for the patient. The problem is it's not covered under most plans because it's a device, not a drug. Um, so I've already alluded to the Contraceptive Choice Project. So the real question is, is there any evidence um, for me to come up here and say we need to switch people in terms of their method as the preferred option? What the Contraceptive Choice, Choice Project, things I like about it, it was funded by um, a rich benefactor of one of the most affluent men in the United States. Um, his second wife has funded a large uh, proportion of family planning education in the United States. And that group came to the research team in St. Louis and said, can you um, demonstrate a way to make a population difference in unintended pregnancy rates and abortion rates based on a research study? So they went away and they came back with this project, which was to take switchers and provide them information and free contraception about any method that they wanted to use, provided they were willing to switch. And the emphasis was always on those methods that had lower failure rates, so IUS, IUD, and in this case, implant. 
What they showed, even though the study um, only had about 2,000 people in it, was that in the place where the study was done, they were able to statistically significantly decrease the rate of abortions in that county. So the thick black bars represent the abortion rate in St. Louis City and the counties that surrounded it where the study was taking place. And then in all other Missouri residents, we don't see a difference because those people were not included. And the only explanation for that that made sense was the increased uptake of larks just within the study alone. I think it's always important to re recall a couple bits of the Choice Project for which we need to use a degree of caution. The counseling sessions were structured, included a video and time with a, um, a lay person who was trained to provide structured counseling, which took 45 minutes. And I'm sure all of you have 45 minutes in your offices to spend with each patient who wants to start an IUD. Similarly, patients had to be switchers, so these were not new starters. And I've already argued uh, the point that we need to be focusing on the switchers or potential switchers, not the, the, the new starts anyways. And although the emphasis on LARC is appropriate, we do have to be very cautious about our own inherent biases when we provide um, contraception counseling. There was a study done um, at basically at one of the ACOG clinical meetings that provided six scenarios to different OBGYNs where they provided high and low socioeconomic actors of various races. And they found that if you, were, you saw the video with a low socioeconomic person or you saw one of the women of color, you were more likely to recommend tubal sterilization than you were in the Caucasian women and in the high socioeconomic status. So we all have to be mindful of our inherent biases that we bring to it. The second one is there's a big push right now among LARC uptake, but we need to remember that patients have the right to use whatever they feel is the most appropriate for them. And so even though we want to encourage high uptake, we need to support them in their choices to use the less effective methods because patients like them and everyone's uh, individual patient method fit is going to change. I think we also do need to be mindful, less so in this country, but we can't be completely immune to it, that we do have a cultural history with respect to aggressive family planning policies, particularly as they pertain to other countries. So it's not surprising when patients are a little bit surprised about the message we're putting forward about trying to reduce unintended pregnancies. The nice thing about these products is that they're reversible, and so that limits the amount of autonomy that is perceived to be taken away from these patients. That being said, um, that's kind of the Debbie Downer part of the talk. Most of our patients will actually choose LARCs if we give them that information. Um, similarly, this is, a, this is a Canadian study done in one of the terminations clinics in BC where they were enrolling women in an RCT about immediate versus delayed insertion of an IUC, copper, or leave gestural post-procedure. And what they found was that just when they were trying to recruit patients for the study, 53% of those women would have chosen an IUC if it was provided at cost. So the majority of the women who are in that situation would choose an IUC if offered to them. In the contraceptive choice project, where they had the 45 minutes, 75% of those women chose a LARC. But bearing in mind, it would have been free no matter what they took. And they could have walked away with free packs of pills as well if they wanted to. And even amongst the younger women, 40% did choose an intrauterine method. A large number of them also chose uh, the implant, um, and that they also had a very high rate of LARC uptake overall. So what I'm coming back to in terms of the reproductive life cycle is that this is the way that we've done things up until now. We tend to, um, in my office what happens is um, usually a, a woman comes to me, the mother comes to me with her arms folded like this and she's scowling at me and she's looking at her daughter who's usually texting and isn't even listening to what I say and she's telling me to start the patient on the pill. Um, and so that's what we do because I'm kind of afraid of the mothers. Um, and uh, then what we do once they're not pregnant anymore, uh, some of us like to use lactational amenorrhea. Um, I already have a reputation despite being only nine months in practice. The nurses on labor and delivery and postpartum know they're not allowed to discharge a patient of mine without a contraceptive script on the chart. So apparently I'm a crazy person for doing that, uh, but so be it. So everyone leaves with a script either for an IUS, IUD, or a progestin-only pill. Um, then when patients are done, um, they um, go and get their sterilization, and then usually somewhere along the way they see one of my uh, mentors who still does tubal reversals um, somewhere along here. And then even if they stay sterile, um, often we're starting IUSs in the older women for menstrual management or some other reason, so there's another foray into contraception. I think we need to reframe this use. As I mentioned, um, this doesn't really fit anymore when we're asking 10 years out of a product that has a 9% failure risk per year. 
do the math. That adds up to 100% pretty quickly. I know that's an overly simplistic view. Um, what I think we need to be considering is use of long-acting reversibles early on to bridge us up until that point of desired first pregnancy. You really get the pick of the litter in between, and that really depends on what patients want to do. Some feel very strongly about child spacing, others don't. Um, and I think actually we underemphasize natural family planning um, and lactational amenorrhea in North America. And then again, when patients are done, really emphasizing the option of having uh, reversibility. What happens over here, for people who are wondering what this green box is, is a lot of patients in my office enter into new relationships and they tell me, I really love him, I want to give him a child. Which always astounds me, because if somebody really loved me, I would like flowers or chocolate, <laughs> as opposed to something that's gonna cost me a quarter million dollars down the road, but you know what? To each their own. So if love is love, so be it. Um, with LARCs, you're not going to have to have that uncomfortable conversation about what we do uh, to get you to that point. Um, and for the purists in the room, yes, menopause is happening a little bit later, so remember that there's some benefit um, there. And we should not forget about our extremes of maternal age in terms of risk of unintended pregnancy. What are the barriers to uptake of LARCs? So um, I've tried to do a good job of selling you, and I can tell some of you still aren't totally convinced, um, and that's very common. Um, so I do want to get a read on the audience because this is going to help me to understand kind of where we're at at this point in time and perhaps where we're going to move. I want to know the reality. I don't want you to tell me what I want you to say. I see my residents sitting in the row there, so they have to be honest this time. So um, I'd like to know what types of IUSs you insert, LNG only, copper only, both, neither, or you're a non-clinician or um, uh, somebody who would never experience contraceptive counseling, which wouldn't be many of us even amongst the subspecialties. Okay, excellent. So I'm in a room of inserters. That's good. Um, okay. Now I'd like to know, um, do you insert them in women under the age of 20 as a general policy? Um, so yes, no, or if you're a non-inserter, you still get to push a button because it's always fun to push the buttons. That's what makes the talks fun. Excellent. So, um, so a fifth of people don't routinely insert them in younger women. And do you insert them in nulliparous women on a routine basis? There's this really cool wave of everyone putting their thing down that it kind of comes this way. It's kind of cool to be up at the top. Okay. Okay, excellent, so 78%. So in fact, um, it looks like from this cohort, if you extrapolate that maybe age is more of a restriction in terms of nulliparity, which probably means that there's more comfort using nullip, uh, putting them in nullips who are a little further along. Uh, this, of course, doesn't include the terminations population, which makes it a little problematic, but we could be here all day just trying to parse out every little bit about you. Um, and although that's interesting, and I'm happy to do that afterwards, um, it's, you're probably not gonna get very much out of it. So whenever I'm not sure what I'm supposed to use, and it's something that's always helpful to have in your back pocket, if you use Apple products, you, there is an app for this. Uh, I can't say that or else I'd be breaching a, a copyright infringement. Um, this is medical eligibility criteria. So in general, if you have a medical problem and you want to know if you can use a product, if it's a one or a two, you can use it. If it's a three or a four, don't use it. If it's a three or a four and the patient wants to use it, send them to your local family planning specialist. If it's a one or a two and they don't want to use it, then pick something else. But in general, nulliparous woman is considered a two, which means the benefits outweigh the risks of use of IUC in nulliparous women. And this data also comes to us from um, the 52 milligram IUS, not the newer one. Um, there have been a couple of global surveys done of experienced inserters, of which I believe 120, it might have been a little bit higher of them were Canadian. Um, and these were people who routinely put IUDs in in a variety of patients. And their biggest concerns, and we're gonna talk about these a little bit, was insertion concerns, PID concerns, pain concerns, and future fertility concerns. Um, so in terms of placement, the placement failure for any IUC is low, copper or LNG. It's about 2.5 to 5%. And we all have those days where it seems like it's 100%, but it's not, it's low. Uh, at, least, at least in my practice, maybe you guys are better than I am. But um, there's no difference in terms of placement failure for nulliparous women or Paris women. Um, there's never been any difference in terms of statistical significance. Healthcare providers may rate the insertion as being more challenging if it's, an, it's in an nullip, but we can still get them in. 
And please, don't routinely use mesoprostol. It does not facilitate insertion. It tends to cause side effects. Um, usually when I'm doing second inserts in difficult insertions, what I think actually happens is the cervix is softer, they're so crampy to begin with, a false passage is more likely to occur, and it either gets in, uh, inserted into the cervix or it can't be cannulated. Um, so um, there is a paper um, in the JOGC from last year uh, which evaluates the randomized control trials all showing no benefit. Expulsion with IUC is a bit challenging. Um, one study actually showed that there was an increased risk in women who've had children before of an expulsion, with the theory being that a larger cavity size and a, and a uterus that's already had practice and is hypertrophied and pushing a baby out is more effective at expelling an IUC, whereas most studies tend to show either no difference or a slightly increased risk of expulsion in the NALIP group. Um, whenever I see papers that show either or or no statistical significance, it probably means that if there is a difference that's so small it doesn't matter to the patient in front of you, or that there's no true difference in expulsion rates. Um, similarly, there's no evidence to support the routine use of ultrasound following insertions. As a general rule for me, if it's a difficult insertion, I will. Um, I know a local practice in our center is to do routine ultrasounds um, for which the data doesn't support. Um, with a string check within the first three months, you will cover the majority of expulsions that occur because over 90% of them occur in the first three months of insertion. Um, pain is always a concern. Um, I just put an IUC in a 16-year-old yesterday who wasn't very happy with me when she left, so I'm always mindful of this. Um, and in general, women tend to rate the IUD insertion as being less painful than they would, uh, than it was expected. So they tend to rate it as expecting it to be somewhere around a four to five out of 10 on a visual analog scale, and it usually comes in somewhere between a three and a four in that particular study. Um, I know these numbers are different, but they're different, they're different studies, so different numbers. The pain may be slightly higher in NALIPS, 2.7 out of 10 versus 1.9 out of 10, um, and that difference was uh, just bordered on statistical significance. But the overall rating is that it was not that bad when you ask them subjectively. Pain appears to be related to distension of the internal cervical os, and we have not come up with a great strategy in terms of how best to minimize that risk. I think all of us in the room who are experienced inserters probably have our tips and tricks of the trade under which to do that, and again, I can't quite belabor the point. One of the current theories is because it's a diameter and a distension issue, perhaps products that have smaller insertion tubes reduce that pain. Um, and there is some evidence in comparative phase three studies that suggest that that's the case. Um, you can't give an IUD talk, especially in younger women, without talking about the Dalcon shield. Uh, and when I was in high school, um, the, what I learned in science class was that IUDs kill women because they cause pelvic infections, and that always has stuck with me for a very, very long time. Um, so we actually, the best data for PID and infection comes from the 90s, and we've never been able to do a better study that comes from the World Health Organization in both developed and developing nations, and it's pretty darn good. What it suggests to us is that the risk factor for an infection following an IUD or an IUS is related to whatever is in the vagina already that's being ascended into the sterile uterus, and therefore the risk of PID is, included, is increased for the first 21 days and returns back to baseline there afterwards. It may actually be lower than the population level, um, depending on what your zero um, prevalence rate is for certain um, infections. There is some theoretical evidence in a very small amount of small studies that suggest that LNG may reduce the risk of PID as well because its main mechanism of action is cervical mucus uh, thickening, which is a very unsexy way to explain it to your patients. It doesn't work. It does not encourage them to use IUDs more if you talk about mucus. Um, and it also is a major mechanism of action in all uh, hormonal contraceptives that contain progesterone or progestin. The risk of PID with any insertion is low, so what is the risk to the patient in front of you and what do I need to do in terms of swabs, common question that comes up. Um, there is now a study of a large cohort study that showed that same day insertion with swabs for those with risk factors, so 25 and under, those who practice non-monogamy or who have a history of STI should have swabs done at the time of insertion, the others do not need it. Um, those women have the same risk of PID as uh, people who swab one day and come the next, and those who um, swab everyone. 
The reason for that is that your risk of having PID with an IUD is low, even if you have an asymptomatic infection. Of course, we don't insert them if it obviously looks like there's an infection there. But in a woman who has an asymptomatic positive chlamydia or gonorrhea, her risk of PID with insertion is still less than 5%. The range in the studies is 0 to 5%, um, and that risk is quite low. Um, BV testing is not needed, but we all go finding it, and we may find it a bit more afterwards. I'm not sure why. No one is entirely sure. And HIV um, is not a contraindication to IUC use. So again, patients who are immune compromised can still have IUDs or IUSs because the risk of infection is low. So in conclusion, I did want to leave a bit of time for discussion, and I know I'm a fast talker. It's because I had too much chocolate before coming up here. Unintended pregnancy continues to be a common problem in Canada. Um, we're getting better, but there's room for improvement. If we look at our comparators in other developed nations, we still have a significant room for improvement. One of the problems we do, especially when we're so close to the border right now, is we look at our neighbors to the south and see how much more uh, further we've come. But those aren't the comparators we should be using if we want to do better. These have real social and economic implications for people. I've given you those numbers already. Younger women have higher contraceptive goals than ever before. We as a society are asking them to stay not pregnant longer because we still have our firmly held beliefs about entrance into marriages or long-term relationships, completion of uh, education prior to child rearing, and women's own goals about where they want to be at a time in their lives where they become parents. So the effectiveness and the duration of child-free living, or the importance of that, is different than it was even for most of us standing here when we were that age. LARCs should be offered as first-line contraceptive op options across the reproductive life cycle. It is recommended as 1A evidence in the current guideline on reducing infection with IUD insertion that adolescents can have it inserted. There is good evidence to say that that uh, is appropriate. There should be no age-related contraindications, and we know that LARCs are acceptable if you offer them to women across the reproductive spectrum. Nullagravity and nulliparity, as well as young age, are not contraindications to IUC use. Um, there's no evidence to support that practice. It may make our jobs a little bit more difficult, but that's why we're here. We're specialists. And smaller copper IUDs and the smaller uh, levonorgestrel IUSs may be slightly more acceptable, certainly in principle to patients and providers, and there may be some um, evidence that, in fact, the insertion goes a little bit easier. We always need to be mindful of our own inherent biases when recommending contraceptive options. So many of you in the room who are reproductive endocrinologists are constantly worried about people's inability to get pregnant. As a family planning person, just sitting in a room with mixed genders really freaks me out that someone's going to get pregnant. So it's important to remember that your patients on, uh, who are in front of you are much more likely to experience unintended pregnancy and abortion than they are infertility. But we as a group are more likely to experience infertility due to our own delayed child rearing. So remember that what's happening to us in our own lives is not the same as what's happening to our patients. Um, if you look at what patients want out of a contraceptive consult, they want help to narrow their decision down, usually to two or three choices, and they want to make the decision on their own. So what I'm only asking you to do is to include LARCs in your two to three options and let them make that decision and support them another way. Um, so that's it for now. If we could invent chocolate oral contraception, I would never get pregnant. I can guarantee that. Um, but until that's perfected, we're kind of stuck with where we're at right now. Um, we have a rather generous amount of time for questions, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kostescu. Um, there's lots of time for questions if, um, if you'd like to ask questions. The intrauterine device, do you insert them during period time, immediate um, uh, on the, the first um, postnatal visit, or at the time of DNC, or time of termination of a pregnancy? I'm thinking particularly the, um, the nulliparous teenager that comes in wants it, that's yeah. one person, and those patients that have a termination of pregnancy. Now, if you do insert it at a time of termination in DNC, the, the complications um, you know, of, of a termination is hemorrhage infection. And you might get hemorrhage and infection at the, also associated with the, with the insertion of the IUD. So uh, I want to know what is your best practice Perfect. advice. Um, so for termination of pregnancy, I do immediate insertion. The reason I do immediate insertion is that the risk of complication remains low. For the woman who is nulliparous but has now had one pregnancy, this is the best time I'm going to achieve cervical dilation. So from a comfort point of view, I'm minimizing a second um, 
problem. Rates of follow-up are hard in the terminations clinic if they're going to go back to be seen. And we know that repeat abortions are much lower if IUCs are inserted immediately rather than a prescription is given. Also, they're lower compared to any other option. Um, for when I place them, um, I don't have the luxury in my office being in an academic practice of really getting to pick and choose when patients show up. Um, so um, there's two strategies that one can employ. Copper, IUS, uh, copper IUDs can be inserted any time in the first 14 days following a menstrual period. Because they do work as an emergency contraceptive, even if they are inserted at the time of ovulation, your pregnancy risk will be nearly zero, even if they're not protecting, although I do encourage bridging. With um, the levonorgestrel IUS, the recommendation is seven days because it takes about a week to get the cervical mucus to the point that it would prevent pregnancy if you look at the concentration data. Um, the other option is to insert at any period of time, which I often do, if the patient can reasonably be reassured about not being pregnant. If they have had a normal menstrual period and have not been sexually active since their period, it doesn't matter. If they are within two weeks of a termination, within three weeks of a pregnancy, if they are not um, uh, breastfeeding, although I usually wait till six, um, and if they are uh, within three months and using lactation amenorrhea effectively, you can be reassured, or if they're using reliable contraception, so you're, you're switching them immediately. Generally, you don't need to, um, to uh, do a preg test. Some, pol some places have policies about routine urine uh, beta pregnancy tests, which I think we all know in this room that would be completely meaningless um, if you're having a peri-insertion conception. So if they are conceiving from intercourse from yesterday, the pregnancy test is going to be negative anyway. So that's the approach I use. Um, th and that is the approach of the WHO selected practice recommendations for contraceptive use. Thanks, Dustin, for an excellent talk. Um, further to that question, I do have a colleague who has an experience of N equals 1 of inserting at the time of delivery. Can you comment about doing yeah, that, please? Yeah. Um, I had a patient all set up to do that, and by goodness, she went and had a preterm delivery, and I wasn't on call. So yeah. um, currently, I'm offering um, post-placental insertion at C-section. Um, it's, it's physically difficult to do at the time of uh, a vaginal delivery. What that entails is taking the IUD or IUS out at the time, inserting it either into the uterus and closing the hysterotomy suture, make sure you push the strings into the vagina, or using a, um, a long curve Kelly, inserting the IUD uh, or IUS to the point of insertion on a bimanual examination. The study that this was done in is in the Czech Republic, and what they showed was that immediate insertion does have a higher rate of expulsion compared to um, insertion at six months, but that the rate of expulsion was higher after immediate insertion up until the six week mark. So if you're gonna do it, you put it in right away. Um, it's, it's very new. There is literature that's going to be coming. I know of one center in the States that's looking at this more. Um, it's, it's pretty um, up and coming medicine. For my, for my high risk contraceptors, so my fertile myrtles in my practice, what I would do in that instance um, is usually they leave the hospital with DMPA on day three once their milk is established and the IUC is put in at uh, six weeks so they're protected throughout. So I, 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 that strategy works well enough for me. I, I don't, I'm not pushing um, immediate insertion, but it, it may be coming. Think here and then over to. Uh, great talk, thank you. I can certainly sympathize with the awkward moments in the office with the teenager and the mother. And one of the, the ways I get around that personally to skirt the issue is to ask the patient if she has any, especially the teenagers, if she has any menstrual irregularities. And when she answers yes, I think to myself, awesome. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, suggest the, like the birth control pill for menstrual regulation with yeah. contraception as a uh, side of, sort of yeah. positive side effect. So, with that in mind, with the new three year um, progesterone-based yep. IUD. The rep was very clear in telling me that I can't promote the menstrual benefits yeah. of insertion like I could with the five-year. I was just wondering if there's any data on that that you know yeah. about or what your experience has been. Yeah, so the, the indication is only conception control. Um, so that's my issues. The, the challenge is, of course, um, in our contraceptors, they tend to be the ones who benefit more from amenorrhea or menstrual management than our heavy menstrual bleeders. So. In my practice, certainly, the rate of amenorrhea is higher for the old 52 milligram IUDs or IUSs um, amongst the young women. With the 13.5, the rates of amenorrhea are quite low. They're less than 10 percent. And um, they're, although periods tend to be improved, it, it may, it's, not, it's not been shown to be superior to, say, uh, short acting like a, a birth control pill. So there is no data that compares the short and the long acting. Um, the converse of that, actually, is 
um, the people I can't convince to get an LNG IUS are, are the university students, so the 18 to 22 year olds, who move away from home and kind of need that monthly text message from Mother Nature that says, okay, you're not pregnant this month, like you dodged the bullet, and they don't like amenorrhea. But the new one is nice for them because if they only have to deal with a 10% chance of that happening, they tend to be a bit more open to the idea. So um, it's a little too new to know when we're gonna be able to use it. Um, it's probably, it's probably you know, in the realm of something like a, like a progestin-only pill um, in terms of kind of variations in bleeding, but you, you may, you're not gonna get as good uh, cycle control as you will with, uh, with the old 52, yeah. Uh, thanks for the excellent talk. Um, this is a scenario. The ultrasound says that the IUCD is obliquely placed in the cavity or embedded on myometrium or it is in the lower part of the uterine cavity. What do we do? Okay. Um, Malrotated IUDs or embedded IUDs should be removed immediately. Um, if it's not perforated, you can reinsert the same day. If there's a perforation, I tend to wait, although I think some people will insert immediately. Um, we do know, and I happen to know from a case, um, that if you make a hole with the sound, the IUD may still migrate through the hole you've made, even if it's correctly located. Low-lying IUDs and IUSs are kind of the bane of our existence. If you wait and re-image them in three months, most of them will actually move up to the fundus. If it's a copper-containing IUC, you need to back up because you may not be maintaining an appropriate level of intrauterine copper ions. But with the LNG, again, certainly the 52, we don't know about the 13.5. You should have enough progestin, and because it's mucus anyways, if it's in the cervix, it should be effective. So if they have an IUS and it's low, they don't need to back up. If it's an IUC, they do, and re-image them at three months. If it's still low, it probably needs to be replaced. Thanks. Um, hi, th and thanks for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, this is a question really about the uh, post-insertion ultrasound as well, and I, I guess I have some concerns about that becoming standard of practice, not just increasingly common practice from the point of view of just healthcare utilization, but the indications, is there not an IUD that has that as a sort of an indication of a practice and insertion that they, ha they recommend that? And just where that may take us down the road in yeah. communities where ultrasound's not that accessible. Yeah, so the current monograph says uh, an assessment. So a pelvic exam would meet that criteria. I'm not aware that ultrasound is mandated. Um, and I think everyone has to apply their own sort of rules around it. Um, we're working on a case series right now in our own center to really look at how many times we make a difference. Um, usually what happens is people are ultrasounding everyone and then they're running into the preceding problem, which is the low sitting IUD, which is probably a variation of normal. Um, so I do echo that sentiment. We're probably spending thousands and thousands of dollars on ultrasounds that don't affect management. Um, so it, I, yeah, I don't think there's evidence to really support us in either direction. But a, a free approach, which is um, to check your strings, um, is also very effective. Um, and I also have patients, what I usually do is threat, they always forget that. So what I do is I have them come to my office at follow-up and tell them I'm going to do a speculum exam, or you can go to the washroom and check your strings for me, and I would say 97% of women just go and check the strings themselves, and, and they're, they're just fine. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Uh, use of uh, laminaria uh, to dilate the cervix. Yeah, great. Um, so similarly to mesoprostol, there's really no evidence to support the use of laminaria. Um, if you can get a laminaria tent in, you can get an IUC in. So most laminaria start at 3 millimeters. The insertion tube for LNG 13.5 is around three and a half millimeters, and it's about 4.25 millimeters for uh, LNG 52. So if you, are, um, if you can get a LAMI in, you can get the IUD in in the first place. Um, so I wouldn't, it doesn't make sense to me. But I mean, I know it's routinely done, and for the same reason that a soft cervix probably isn't easier, um, I, I wouldn't use it. 